Welcome to Startup Dialogues. This is an initiative by Enterprise Bureau to ensure that we provide data to startups and the startup ecosystem to help them make informed decisions and to prevent the failure rates, which currently stands at three out of five startups. Today, I am privileged to be with a friend and a young man that has done tremendously well in this startup tech ecosystem. And I'm looking forward to having this interview with him. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Startup Dialogues by Enterprise Bureau. Here with me is Foster Akugri. Is it correct? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we were. A continue. friend who doesn't know my surname. Oh, I know. I just haven't pronounced it before. We'll, we'll I've fight, never pronounced we'll take it before. that fight. On another All right. Day. You tell our audience who Foster is. That's a difficult question. Okay. But I always try to round up who I am uh, to my purpose, helping people find their path. Okay. And so, be it an organization or an individual, I have the chance to interact with and help solve their problems. It's me fulfilling my purpose on earth. Mm. And so, that sums up everything I do. That's interesting. What typical problems would you say that you are good at solving? Do you believe in generalists? Uh, not really. I mean, especially okay. now so, that is... <laughs> so, growing up, I was a very curious cat. Mm. And... I grew up, when I was growing up, my first aspiration was to become a medical doctor mm. because that's what was seeded into my mind. But as, out of curiosity, as I started to discover myself, started to realize what else was, was out there, having access to the computer, having access to the internet for the first time, meeting other people in, and getting into other people's worlds, I realized there were different things that I was good at mm. and I, I had interest in. I'm a very hands-on person, very creative. Uh, person and so it gave me the opportunity to explore and every new path I unlocked I wanted to be a master of that subject mm. right so I've transitioned from wanting to be an architect to wanting to be a mason a plumber a painter an artist uh, to, to an, even an author when mm. I was 14 I tried to write a book right called the necessity for planning at, at the age of 14. Wow. Right? And all these stem from the exposure I had. I used to listen to, then there were cassettes. Mm -hmm. We didn't have podcasts like yeah. we have today on Apple Podcasts and Google and likes. There were cassettes. And at the time, we had Imanol Day to me mm -hmm. and Cole, mm -hmm. who were like motivational speakers sharing their journey, yeah. how they lived in Legon and how they transitioned mm -hmm. and all of that. And so I was very privy to that information very early. And it forced me, because they shared stories of impossible things happening, mm. right? Mm. They broke boundaries, they were pioneers of new frontiers. And so it gave me that motivation and courage that I could be. Because mm. I, I was born in Ashaiman. Yeah. Somewhere in the suburbs of Ashaiman mm. to, to two parents who had migrated from the north, eventually found a comfortable job mm. which was paying enough for them to, to, to live a certain life they wanted. Mm. And eventually we migrated out of the, the typical suburbs of Ashaiman into mm. the uh, outer, outermost parts. Now these places have become very developed, right? So when we moved to our new neighborhood in Lebanon, we were, we, there were practically three or four houses mm. that you could see from a house and everything was bush, mm. right? So we grew up in that environment, very few friends. All we had was adventure. Mm. Playing the bushes with the snakes, set uh, rabbit traps, rat traps. There was a dam across the road. You go, you learn how to fish with the fishermen. So we got to learn, we had the opportunity to be exposed, exposed. to so many adventures that a typical child growing on a farm would learn. Mm. And so when I found myself in the new era, being exposed to tech and all these things. I had gone through the rigor of not being exposed to technology and transitioning into the new world of mobile phones, internet, computers, and the likes. And so I was very curious. I wanted to unlock a lot of things. And that's, that's the start of my journey to becoming a generalist. <laughs> all right, so we're still, <laughs> we're still on the startup dialogues by the Enterprise Bureau. Our focus is to ensure you have the data you need to make those decisions to ensure your growth. First, how has the world changed? Tell us about the global economy. How has it evolved looking at when you were maybe in SS, university, and now? 
how has it changed and what are some of the things that we should be mindful of? Mm. I'm still very young, <laughs> but at least I was old enough when the recession happened in 2008. Exactly. The significant revolution since then, mm -hmm. from 2009 to today, I saw a lot at the time. I was conscious, I knew right from wrong and all of that. And when I got into the university, all through to today, I've seen how fast things have changed. Mm. I was born before mobile money was invented, so, exactly. at least, so at least, yeah. I didn't <laughs> see it as I came to meet it. Like mm -hmm. people who were born in 2010, they it, so they, it's normal. people who were born in 2008 yeah. think mobile money has always existed. True. ATM cards have always existed. No, all these things weren't there before, True. right? We didn't have laptops and all these no, smartphones no, and yeah. iPhone 12 and 1,000 cameras and all that. For you to have a five megapixel phone that was like, meant yeah. a lot, yeah. right? Or for you to even have a phone that has a camera mm -hmm. a Motorola flip. meant a lot. <laughs> <laughs> V3. I know. Right? <laughs> meant a lot. So seeing the global transition in terms of industry, in terms of access to electricity, mm -hmm. access to uh, affordable house, and access, I'm veering a bit off to mm -hmm. macros like. When I was born in Ashaiman, mm -hmm. we could count the houses. Today, the traffic, the traffic to that area, <laughs> the migration, yeah. the extension all the way now. Before you travel from Ashaiman mm -hmm. into Medina, it's like you are traveling to the north. Exactly. Today, it's 30 minutes mm -hmm. drive, the it's smooth road. Mm -hmm. the, the two cities have merged, True. so it is no more even seen as an isolation. I live in Adrinkano. Mm -hmm. There are cars that move from Adrinkano into Ashaiman straight yeah. away. Like, those things didn't exist. Mobility wasn't that friendly, wasn't that easy. They were very limited routes. You have to drop off and walk exactly. or take dropping. Yeah. I don't know if dropping still exist. Yeah. Taxi, oh, no. dropping, <laughs> all those things, right? So... Seeing where we are today, mm -hmm. I think there's been significant paradigm shifts in mm -hmm. so many things that we have to be very grateful for. We beat the governments every day. Mm -hmm. We complain about crisis, global crisis and all of that. But I tell you, I for one, I'm very grateful for mm -hmm. where I am, mm -hmm. right? And I believe that there's even more prospects ahead in terms of the global transition. When it comes to the tech and entrepreneurship space, mm -hmm. um, We've seen a significant shift. Like I mentioned, when I was in the university till now, it's not too long ago, yeah. right? It's not even a decade yet, but we've seen the rise of tech hubs. We've it's seen the so rise nice. of yeah. programming uh, initiative. Least, Everybody yeah. wants to learn how to code, graphic exactly. design, and all that, exactly. right? Those, the demand, the type of talents that are in demand today are changing mm -hmm. in all that. So we, we've, we've come far where we talk about the global transition. Today, we live in the fourth industrial revolution, as mm. it was coined uh, by Professor Klaus Schwab, the, mm. pres the president and founder of the World Economic Forum. Now, it talks about the, the, the present future mm. where the physical, the biological, and chemical spheres interact. Mm -hmm. And so you take things like today, as we call the internet of things, mm -hmm. hardware devices, you go home, you clap your hands and your light things goes up. up. You clap your hands and light comes on. <laughs> yeah. When Safo Kantanka was doing these things, we found them very, I mean, very miraculous. Exactly. But today, we see them to be normal because it took the white man to tell us that it is possible. You know, but a black man was already, already doing it, it right? And so all these things are becoming norms for us. We are starting to see possibility in what Africa can do as a powerhouse. Mm. And, I, and I keep saying and I'll keep predicting that Africa is going to control the global powerhouse mm. of talent for the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. Why? Because the population of Africa is going to become way higher. Mm -hmm. will almost be, will be half the rest of the population of the world. That means 50% of the global population will be Africans living in Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a significant portion of our population is going to be below the ages of 24. Mm -hmm. This means we are going to have a large mass, a mass falling Talent. within the working populace, mm -hmm. right? The working population, young workforce. Exactly. What does it mean to countries like Italy mm -hmm. with a very aged population? They're going to have a high dependency ratio, exactly. and that means there's going to be a net export of talent out of Africa into these countries to service the country's productivity so that they can pay more tax, they can generate more money from taxes mm -hmm. to take care of the dependency exactly. ratio. 
And so Africa now falls in a very unique position to start preparing ahead of the journey. And we at Hack Lab Foundation's focus is to leapfrog that journey mm. by creating the supply ahead of the demand. True. Building the requisite talent now ahead of when companies will start to think they need, they it. need it. So our job is to keep researching and identifying what potential areas will be needed in two, three years from now mm. and start to drive conversations around that, start to shift the minds of young people around that to focus on these areas yeah. as we make as we make the, the, the transition to those times. Well, I mean, from everything you're saying, it looks as if it's all, you know, like rosy and, and, and nothing seems to be wrong. But I think you're just being overly optimistic because if you look at the young people mm. that exist now, especially those that say they don't have jobs, they don't have work. And it looks to me like there's a shift in the world of work, which probably a lot of them are not recognizing. So if you can throw a bit more light about the world of work, how has it changed? Because, you know, before, Everybody was a fan of getting a job, going from 9 to or 8 to 4 or 8 to 5 or whatever and the whole brick and mortar system and everything and there's been this whole like COVID has changed everything and now we're working from home. Tell us a bit about how the world of work has evolved mm. and what young people should be mm. aware of. So I talked about journalists mm -hmm. and how my journey started. And Today, I'm in high demand mm. because there are few people like us, exactly. right, who have the ability to make shifts. We call it cognitive flexibility. Mm. I can, in a space of an hour, make switches between three different topics mm -hmm. or three different domains and have meetings, productive meetings in each one of the conversations okay. because I'm trained with the ability to do so. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who are coming up are born and raised in a narrow path. Mm. And so the discomfort of making a shift is a big struggle for a lot of people. Right? So today, when we talk about skills, we are no more talking about what technical skills do you have. Mm. It is what soft skill do you have that makes you adaptable to any technical ex environment you're exposed to. Today, it, it doesn't matter whether you have a computer science degree mm -hmm. or a, an MBA or a PhD. Do you have these soft skills first mm -hmm. and after that, okay, what technical skill comes as an added value to you so, exactly. that makes us identify you in a unique area? Mm. And so that is how the, the triangle has turned, the pyramid has turned upside, upside down, down, where the skills that were not really a priority mm. and fell at the base of the pyramid are now at the top. So when you look at the pyramid, right, you realize that most of the soft skills are at the base of mm -hmm. the pyramid. If you turn that upside down, today, a lot of those skill sets are required to help shape you for the organization. No more you shape yourself before you get into an organization. And so a lot of young people need to start thinking about while I'm pursuing this academic prowess, what do I need to cushion myself to adjust to any organization? Uh, there's a profound statement by the, the, press, the CEO of Microsoft that every company is a software company now. Mm -hmm. So even if you run a supermarket, Still some way, somehow, you are, for you to stay, yeah. to survive the future, you need to have some tech mm -hmm. enablement, either stock taking, um, accounting, accounting all these all things, things because yeah. that is how you streamline your operations and get, adjust to the new, new normal, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of these skill sets, though these technical skills today, we are talking about coding, mm -hmm. there's something about computer science or computer engineering that builds your brain. It's, it puts you in a position where you, you can think operationally, you can think technically, and you, are, you think in a chronological order, like algorithmically, right? So if they say, I want to drink water, what steps do I take to drink water? Because that's how you are trained to program. And so you naturally build the faculty to be able to break down processes and see where gaps are. Today, I, I studied computer science as my first degree, transitioned to process engineering, and I did analytics, uh, decision making, and, and innovation as a third degree. Right? And all these come together to help me make decisions in every space I work in, either in finance, either in entrepreneurship, either in policy, leadership, everything. Everything is centered around this thing. So, you want to prioritize that as a young person. Mm -hmm to learn and build these soft skills. And they are not taught in class. Yeah. Yeah. You have to take internships. 
you have to i always say that if nobody is willing to take you on for an intention mm -hmm. create your platform yeah right if it is about testing an idea before you turn 30 mm -hmm. you your risk of I mean, of making mistakes is very low exactly someone is probably taking care of you you are living in your parents house mm -hmm. All these things and so you're not thinking about rent you're not thinking about car service and maintenance buying fuel all these things if you have a car and all of that even though you may want a certain level of independence and all of that take the opportunity to experiment and break things right my days in the university were spent experimenting things i sold tickets i sold airtime i used to run printing in my room i saw pure water i did uh, student politics I took myself into every dungeon possible to stretch myself mm -hmm. and come out with little bits of experience exactly. in every area. So if I sit with a politician today, yeah, I understand the dynamics of a politician, right? So it's all these things make you unique and build a package mm -hmm. out of who you should be, preparing you for the world out there. Well, this, this, this is Startup Dialogues by the Enterprise Bureau, and we are here with Foster from uh, Ashaiman, the, the president of Foster Nation. <laughs> <laughs> I've, 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 I've conferred on him. Okay. I received it. But, I mean, uh, Foster, it's, it's interesting from your upbringing, the experiences you had, the exposure, you went to school, the things you got yourself into, and all those things. Typically, I would want us to talk about the challenge we have with our educational system, but rather I would... I would want to I would want us to look at what we are getting right now mm. and what essential skills I mean you've talked about this the, the soft skills but let's go into tech now what essential technology skills or technology driven skills do young people generally have to immerse themselves in especially whilst they're in school and what are our educational system getting right now mm. very very important question and when we talk about building tech skills, it's not just about coding. Mm -hmm. which, Everybody, which was before, some time back. Yeah. That was what it was. It's about <laughs> two, three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. Because of this new era, everyone is like, you need to learn how to, to code. code right. Today, there's an emergence of new skill sets. Uh, there's a team working in the inside the incubator. They have representations in, in UX, UI design. Mm -hmm. So you learn how to build graphical interfaces. Um, even beyond that, there's a science to designing a process mm. right and so you being the person who understands the science could be behind the ux ui designer guiding him or her mm -hmm. because they have the creativity mm -hmm. you have the process engineering skill yeah. so the two of you combined allow you to build the best experience for the user at the end okay. of the day we have new things like scrum mm -hmm. so scrum is a methodology similar to like agile we are working on project management mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. it's a project management tech, uh, tech exactly. methodology it allows you to work in a certain uh, sequential manner to deliver products mm -hmm. faster to markets. And so today when you look at business in the, in the business space, this, your speed to market mm -hmm. is what gives you pri uh, velocity over your other competitors. And being able to do that is your ability to have a culture like Scrum running exactly. within your organization. So learning about this methodology gives you a competitive advantage. Because like I mentioned, every organization is a software company as exactly. per the CEO well, of Microsoft. Yeah. And so once you have that skill, the likelihood you'll be taken anywhere is possible because organizational cultural fit is a big thing for hiring managers exactly. and recruiters making decisions. Exactly. Uh, beyond that, coding, yes, okay. you have high value talent, but I always say the business of a software company or a software is makes you more money than being the one engineering exactly. the software. Yeah, so <laughs> you want to know where you are, whether if you have the business acumen, build a skill, mm -hmm. understand the technology, understand the tech space, have a little knowledge about the space so that when you are working with people who have the technical skill, yeah, you know how to yeah. communicate better to them as compared to someone who totally doesn't understand. At Anything all. they tell you, you just nod and say, okay, it doesn't really work well, it doesn't give you an advantage. So you want to identify what career path you want to take. But beyond that, if you are studying law, you are studying medicine, you are studying music, you are studying to be a, mu a DJ, whichever space, you are not left behind when it comes to the disruption of technology in these spaces. Today, if you used to uh, bend CDs and sell, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to it's, learn it's about <laughs> digital music distribution. Exactly. Right? There's the emergence of NFTs, blockchain, uh, digital arts, 
and all these experience augmented and mixed reality you want to you want to be curious about these things and start to figure out how you play in or where you fit in based on your curiosity levels and your skills what are the schools getting right and generally what is africa getting right and what we sh what should we improve on I think the thing really is our expectations about what the school should get right. Mm. It's what we get wrong. Okay. Right? The a first degree is not meant to give you the skill set you need to be in the job market, mm -hmm. to play in the job market. That's interesting. Right? And if you understand this from onset, you don't blame the schools for what they teach. Mm. Okay. <laughs> if you take your kid to primary school, they are supposed to build motor skills, ability to write. They are exactly. supposed to build ability to think, mm -hmm. ability to make logical decisions. Exactly. When they transition from there, they now start to be exposed to what general areas exist that they could build a profession in. Mm -hmm. That is secondary school. Mm -hmm. When you get to the university, you choose a path to build a general knowledge as your first degree in a specialized area. Mm -hmm. So if you choose computer science, they teach you the broad foundations of computer science as your first degree. Mm -hmm. For you to be exceptional as a fresh graduate, you need to take on extracurricular activities mm -hmm. outside of that domain. That is stretching yourself and taking extra lessons mm. to be unique among your peers. Okay. If you decide to go through the right the passage, then you should know that you don't expect to land a job as fast as your peers who are stretching that? themselves. Because exactly. again, based on human beings, natural selection, we have to find a way to survive and outcompete each other. Exactly. And to do that, we need to, some of us stretch ourselves because we have the ability and the zeal too. Mm. We have the curiosity too. Mm. The others who don't fall in the mass. And the mass are the people who remain unemployed for mm. a longer time. Okay. Right? Okay. Today we are forcing everyone to be as competitive as, the, as the, the chosen few. The chosen <laughs> few right? But it can't be like that. Okay. So I call something social balance. Mm. Social balance, if you have an understanding of the social balance theory, which I coined, which I don't know really exists, mm -hmm. The hawker on the street exists so that when you are thirsty and you are in a car, you can, get you can get something to drink. And it is an African thing. Mm. If you go to New York, there's yeah, a working uh, lifestyle exactly. because everything is in close proximity. Mm -hmm. The anatomy of how the society is designed, how our communities are designed, influences what we see as, or what we should see as our aspirational destination. Mm. Foster Nation <laughs> Social Balance, you heard it first on the Startup Dialogue powered by the Enterprise Bureau. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Startup Dialogues by the Enterprise Bureau. Our focus is to provide you the data you need to make those decisions that ensures your growth. And we're here, well, we've been here talking uh, about so many things, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping that you're learning because that's the essence of this whole show. We are concluding. And uh, in conclusion, I just want you to tell us, what should Africa do going forward? I think the, the problem is with the people, mm. our expectations and what we are benchmarking. Um, I believe that modern, modernizing Africa is not about westernizing Africa. Okay. And because our problems are peculiar to us, we need to give a new perspective to build solutions that work for us. Importing and trying to make things fit square pegs to fit in round holes in Africa is what has caused us so much problems. Mm. But we are starting to get to a point of realization. Our African leaders are starting to champion the conversations and the dream of, of, of the likes of Kwame Nkrumah uh, and Thomas Sankara and mm. Co. Uh, for Africa to become independent on its own, to think for itself and to solve its own problems in its mm. own ways. And headed there is the emergence of these tech hubs and Co. who are starting to instill some level of confidence in young people. Mm -hmm. We've seen a trend of big techs migrating to Africa. You take the likes of Microsoft, you take the likes of uh, Google, mm -hmm. you take the likes of Facebook, Facebook and co-building centers, Twitter, Twitter yeah. building centers in Africa. This is because they realize that they can't solve African problems outside of Africa for mm -hmm. Africans. Okay. And you need Africans to solve our own problems. Mm -hmm. But to do that, we need to believe in ourselves. And this de-migrating is a sign of fact that we are doing something right exactly. so i want to urge all africans that as we rise mm -hmm. <coughs> let's rise in confidence as we rise <laughs> let's rise in confidence and there's one thing you said modernizing africa is not westernizing africa and we should be careful about bringing wholesale 
you know, interventions into our continent of Africa. Please, look into the camera and advise our young ones. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think the honest truth, uh, speaking to you, every young one out there, including myself, is there's no blanket advice for you as a young person. Curate your own path, follow your dreams. Uh, you'll be faced with so many obstacles. Be ready to face them, build armors. And I always say that your failures are to your toolbox. And your toolbox is what makes you a master of your craft in the space you find yourself in. That is basically what will differentiate you. So while you are doing you, just be careful, be cautious, stay healthy, and live long to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Thank you very much. Wow. All right. Thank you very much. This has been another amazing and insightful edition of the Startup Dialogues powered by Enterprise Bureau. And my name, as always, is Echo Mentor. I'll be with you again next time.